here with Yochai Benkler uh, at uh, the EG8 uh, conference in Paris. Uh, you just came away from a press conference. Uh, what's at stake here as we talk about the open internet and the policy that uh, they're going to be bringing to the G8 tomorrow? I think what's at stake is what's been at stake for over 15 years. And what for a few years we thought uh, was done, but seems to be on a resurgence, which is the possibility that a coalition of forces that are afraid of the net will try to shut it down. The core drivers of this coalition here are 20th century industrial model content media companies. It's very clear that the central agenda, we saw that yesterday both in the major, the, the amount of time spent by President Sarkozy on this, we saw this uh, yesterday in the afternoon panel, uh, a major part of this is trying to make sure that technology, internet service providers, and governments going after individual uh, users are used to constrain how we use the net to make it safe for selling culture in containments, in containers. That's last century's model. We've known it for over a decade. It felt like it was something that was more or less resolved. It seems to be very powerfully resurgent. It also seems to be in an interesting and unholy alliance with security concerns. So you have an increase in concern for cyber war and cyber security, which may well be at least in part legitimate, aligning itself with incumbent industries to scare us from the open net. And the concern is that a combination of those two forces, together with a small number of originally very innovative dispersed firms, like, for example, Google, that are beginning to be more comfortable in the model, in, in the role of a large firm, agreeing to a more docile net, to a net, as President Sarkozy called it, called it that's more civilized. I think what we're seeing here in this group, in the press release, in many of the comments from the audiences, in the applause and lack of applause to certain lines that people uh, uh, on the uh, stage are allowed to make, is that there's still a very powerful counter-argument, one that says both for innovation and for freedom we need an open net. Both for growth and welfare and for democracy and participation, we need to make sure that the internet remains an open internet, remains a commons we all share, remains neutral at all layers, at the physical layer, at the logical layer, at the data layer, at the content layer, at all of these layers, we must have an open internet. That's still very strong, but it seems more threatened today than it has been for five or six years. We seem to be closer to the risk we were at in the late 90s than the risk we were at five years ago. What's changed? Why is this conversation happening here and now in Paris? Um, how much of a risk is there right now? I think several things have uh, changed. The first critical thing is uh, the shift to uh, mobile broadband and the possibility that in that shift, the primary way we will use the net will be one that comes from a tradition of controlled networks instead of one that comes from a tradition of, an, of a closed network. We run the risk that Google on Android, on Verizon, or Apple on iPhone, on AT&T, becomes a model of a controlled internet that then is very good about having well-behaved devices like the iPad that can enforce the distribution policies of incumbent industries instead of the much more robust and exciting and active, uh, uh, diverse, decentralized creativity process that has been the core of the last 10 years. So I think the move to mobility is one critical uh, area. I think the potential for closed devices like the iPhone and the iPad has created new, potentially compliant and well-behaved uh, platforms that is giving the media industry uh, new uh, air. I think the increase in bandwidth has made the threat to video also apparent in a way that the threat to music was in the past, so you're having a resurgent set of concerns from the video industry to where the recording industry was 10 years ago, and I think it's the addition of security as an overarching rhetoric that says you have to be very afraid of an open net because of terrorism lining up with this set of interest of the content industry incumbents. 
Now, one of the things that President Sarkozy mentioned yesterday was uh, the role of technology in uh, Middle East uh, revolutions. Uh, President Obama has hailed that as well as Secretary Clinton, a host of different rulers. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago was the uh, decreased level of activation it takes for people to share their voices. Um, to what extent do politicians need to understand the relationship of free speech and an open internet? I think free speech is absolutely critical to the reason we have an open internet and the pathway we might uh, uh, preserve it. Um, I think that it is the primary reason we need to support the net is because it is a foundational part of how we have our democracy. I find, for example, that the U.S. position on the Arab Spring and the role of the Internet in the Arab Spring extremely ironically juxtaposed to the way in which the United States responded, at least publicly and formally, if not yet legally, to the WikiLeaks case. Hmm. I think the idea that you can sit and say, open is good for you, uh, uh, government transparency is good for you, but we worry about WikiLeaks, not about the, the, the not about Bradley Manning, if that's in fact uh, uh, who it was, as it is, uh, as it's alleged, but about WikiLeaks itself. That extreme response in public comments against WikiLeaks suggests a real incongruity between understanding the hope and at the same time being fearful. I think one of the things that the G8 countries need to recognize is that even though there's a real difference, of course, between dictatorships and democracies, the G8 leaders need to understand that they are operating in a world where their populations can activate much more effectively. They have to find ways to be more attentive to the people through the net. And some are trying to do it, but not yet enough. Nowhere near enough. Now, there are many people um, in the entertainment industries who are worried that they will not be compensated for their um, intellectual property anymore. That was a driving concern brought up here, particularly by those that have owned the distribution networks over time. One of the things that you've written that I still consult is the wealth of networks. How have the shift between 20th century models for creativity and um, the way that the value is captured and the 21st century model enabled by the internet. Um, how has that moved and how, sh how can and should um, the creative producers of today be thinking about that um, and the policymakers who are thinking about regulatory regimes for the 21st century be thinking about that? I think one of the things that we see that's extraordinarily exciting is how creators are finding new ways to fund themselves, to create new uh, organizations. If you just look at bloggers who set up their own, instead of trying to join one of a very small number of existing newspapers or magazines, set up their own platforms at relatively low cost and are able to make enough from some group blog and their uh, advertising and ad stream to make it at least a significant part of their work. I think one of the most exciting um, um, developments has been the way in which recording artists, new uh, musicians, have been able to find ways to connect with their audiences free of the control of the labels. Earlier this morning, um, um, uh, Brian Messenger, the, 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 the uh, Radiohead's manager, uh, stood up and talked about how much freedom there was uh, and how important it was that the G8 support the kinds of free-flowing digital uh, 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 compensation exchange model that's been proposed now in the UK that isn't built on controlling everything. It's built on creating simple ways for people to, char to pay small amounts to, their, uh, uh, to, their, uh, to the musicians they love. We've just done a study that looked at mid-level musicians who are able to set up relationships with their fans. The fans love the music. The fans love the musicians. The issue is not trying to not pay uh, uh, musicians. And I think what's happening with young musicians is that they're learning to be independent. They're learning to create new relationships with their fans. And these engaged fans then are more than happy to pay, even when the material is downloaded, uh, uh, is available for download in perfect format under uh, Creative Commons. It's perfectly legal to download, and yet people pay, and they pay even more than the 99 cents for a song in, in, in one of the studies that we did, or, or pay more uh, than the minimal required uh, uh, over years of data. 
So we see those models. We see in free software, we see people combining, creating, <coughs> with then selling their own services. We see, just as we see academics, we write and we teach. We're a service business. Software developers write, deliver free software and a service model. You see musicians, their music is available. Some of it is paid for, by fans who love them. Much of it is paid by performance. Each and every industry is different. Hollywood has its own very high production cost. It presents a different problem, but it also has a very different uh, uh, appropriation uh, model. The theater. The theater uses real property, not intellectual property, and that's a core model. You see bundled distribution packets like cable. That's not a problem. There you have the streams. The thing that needs to be preserved is the, re is the resistance to trying to control every single use. It is important for creators to be able to make money. It is also important to understand that they can't make every little bit of money possible without severely undermining the net. That needs to be understood and it needs to be a real limit on policy. You've mentioned the security concerns that have been cropping up quite a bit and uh, it's covering the government technology space. I hear the word cyber all over the place even though it feels to me like a uh, remnant of the early 90s uh, cyberspace. But that was the um, name for the international cyberspace strategy that the White House released last uh, week. Um, is there a factor of fear there? Is it lack of understanding? Or is it simply using nomenclature um, of a different time and place that describes where we are now? I think it's a combination of legitimate concerns and uh, overblown concerns and opportunism. Uh, clearly, there are legitimate concerns. The more dependent we are on the open internet to have mission critical uh, uh, functions, the more susceptible we, we might be to uh, attack, and it's a completely legitimate subject uh, to look at. There are real questions of how much of the, of the solution needs to be by recentralizing, or not recentralization, centralization, and coming up with a fortress mentality, as opposed to how much we need to push solutions to the edges, like completely redundant and robust servers like the Freedom Boxes that Evan Moglen is working on. Um, uh, or completely uh, redundant uh, in, uh, uh, encryption like PGP uh, to begin with. That's widely distributed. Distributed solutions are one thing. Fortress solutions are another. And I think that's an important distinction. I think at the same time, there are also people for whom it's an industry. It's an industry. So there are certainly companies whose job it is to provide solutions. And the more you say that the problem is uh, big, the bigger of a market you have. And the third is, opportunity, is opportunism, and I think that's where we see the intellectual property uh, industry coming and trying to ride on top of security to say we have to take those solutions, the solutions that clamp down in order to achieve our results. At the end of the day, does this conference matter? We'll see. It's too soon to tell. Um, this conference could matter if the message continues to be as tightly scripted as the efforts of the organizers seem to make it, and that gets converted into an alignment between the G8, between the various players who are afraid of different kinds of threats from the open internet. My intuition is, my hope, is that there's been enough of a voice of the opposition that that core claim that there's consensus that we need to civilize or slow down or calm the net or, or make it more compliant, that that is very far from the consensus. And if that comes out of this conference, and if that influences the actual debate that says, you know what, the political risk of going to a closed internet is too great, then it should have been a useful conference. Uh, otherwise, it's a really threatening. Well, I was glad to join you here. Thank you for the question, sir. Thank you.